So, first Sunday of Easter, he's risen. He's risen indeed. And you, you know my spiel every, Christ, every, every Christmas. Every, <laughs> every Easter, that's not their first response. That's not the first greeting. The first greeting was someone said, came running out of breath, I've seen him. And they said, what? That's the first Easter greeting. They just said, what? You know, that's the way it went for several days. What? Incredulous. Now, it took a while, it took weeks or maybe even years for some to, once they encountered the risen Christ themselves, they said, oh, he's risen indeed. The tragedy is today, most people say he's risen and they get a response like this. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah, the creator of the universe invaded humanity and took on human form and died for the sins of the entire human race and defeated sin and death by rising from the dead in three days. He's going to come back to bring human history to a resolution. Oh, yeah, that. We're numb to this event, which changes everything. Changes absolutely everything. And we're always in danger of dressing up in finery and surrounding it with chocolate and bunnies. <laughs> It's the most dangerous fact in human history. How do you know he lives? You ask me how I know he lives. Listen to this story. In 1970, I was headed to Vietnam. Before my flight, a young medic gave me a small booklet about how to know God. After a few hours in the air, I pulled the booklet out from my pocket and began to read. I didn't understand much, but it did say that I was created by God. That thought caught my attention. There were a lot of fear in that plane, filled, that plane filled with young soldiers headed for battle. For the first time in my life, though, I began to really pray, okay, God, if I was created by you, then if I live, it's up to you, and if I die, it's up to you. At that very moment, a peace came over me that I had never known. All the fear was gone. I didn't yet understand salvation through Jesus Christ, but I, I knew God was with me. When I was discharged a year later, I began to search for, for my purpose. I soon met and married my wife, Deb. I was not a Christian. I was living a life of sin. How could I do anything else? One Sunday, we were driving from Olivet to Battle Creek. I knew that I needed to change, but, but how? We drove by a church a short distance from our home. I told Deb, we have to stop there. So we pulled in. The singing had already started, and we sat near the back. After the message, the pastor gave an invitation to receive Christ. I was ready. I went forward to the altar, confessed that I was a sinner, and asked Christ into my heart. While walking out, I felt like a whole new man. But I still heard Satan's voice saying, Why would Jesus forgive all your sins? Are you sure? That night, I went to bed sensing the presence of Christ, but I still wondered if he really accepted me as his child. While in a deep sleep, I had a vision. I saw Jesus at a distance under a tree talking to someone. I had to know, are all my sins really forgiven? Scared, I walked towards him, and when I was close enough to see his eyes, he opened his arms to me. I woke suddenly to an overwhelming sense of comfort and joy. The vision confirmed the purpose, the promise that I'd read in his word in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I trusted in Jesus. I knew that I had been born again in Christ. I was and am a child of God. Jesus had revealed to me how he always had been with me, even in my brokenness. He sometimes speaks to me by calling me to do things that I'm reluctant to do. For example, I'm hesitant to share that for 15 years I occasionally drank to excess and I was unable to stop. Much after, prayer, after much prayer, however, Jesus provided a way and delivered me overnight. I definitely didn't want to share, I don't, definitely don't want to share with you that I was in a marriage that ended in divorce. I was unable to forgive myself, but the risen Christ made it possible for me to be forgiven. It was on Easter Sunday, 26 years ago, 
that Jesus reached out to me and helped me understand that for the first time, he had suffered and died for me personally. I pray that you might come to know him as well. Amen. Man, thank Joe and Don for those testimonies. Those are older stories. We've got more, more coming. Take a Bible and turn with me to John chapter 20. The resurrection story continues. This happens Sunday night, tonight. John chapter 20, verse 19 through 22. I'm going to pull out six things that this story tells us that are very important for us to understand today. John 20, 19 through 22. Here's how it reads. On the evening of that first day, which is tonight... When the disciples were together, the doors were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them, and he said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, the wounds in his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, for a second time, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me. I'm sending you. And with that, he breathed on them, and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Lord, open up your word to us. It's not enough for us to talk about the risen Christ. You are here now. Penetrate locked doors, locked hearts today, and reveal yourself today, our risen Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Six things about this quick story. Here's the first one. Jesus came and stood among them. If you were here a year ago, I told a story about Uncle Bob. You may remember my Uncle Bob, or at least the story about the Uncle Bob. He died several years ago. For lack of words to describe the resurrection, it's kind of like Uncle Bob dying. And you know who've lost a loved one. This is exactly the story I told a year ago, only it has a different twist. Uh, When someone dies in your family, that sets in motion a whole set of events. You call the um, mortuary, they take care of the body. You call friends and family, you get on the phone and people gather and they're arranging their schedules and getting off work and taking care of the pets, traveling long distance. You got to order flowers, you got to sign death certificates, you got to call the insurance company. A lot of work goes into this and they got to pull it together in three days. I've always marveled, why can't you pull a wedding together in three days? You can pull a funeral together in three days. Everybody comes, and then they have a viewing the day before, and people bring in food, and the viewing is from 2 to 4, and from 6 to 8, and then the next day you have a funeral service, and everybody comes, and then you go to the cemetery, and you have the burial, and you come back and eat potato salad. And at the end of the day, you are exhausted, and you go home, and you still got out-of-town family who are staying at your house, and you change into clothes that are comfortable, and you gather on the kitchen, and you rummage around for piles of leftovers that are all brought to your house, and you sit around, and you're reminiscing on the day, and you're about to fall asleep, and then all of a sudden, Uncle Bob shows up. Remember this story? And he's wearing the suit that you bought for his burial. It doesn't fit very well. And he's not wearing shoes because you didn't think he needed them. And he smells like formaldehyde. And he stands there and he says, hey. (laughs) And you don't know in that moment whether to fall on your face or to jump out of your chair. You don't know whether to run and hug him or to scream and run out the door the other direction. You don't know because you didn't expect Bob to come back. I told this story a year ago. Easter is kind of like that, but it's not really like that. Because you're never expecting a resurrection. And here's the deal. Those disciples in that upper room weren't either. There are critics of of biblical faith that say, you know, back in those days, people had superstition and they were primitive in their beliefs. We now have the benefit of modern science. So it makes sense that they would believe in resurrection. And we now are more sophisticated because we know that people don't die and rise from the dead. Have you heard that? Well, I got news for you. They didn't believe in resurrection either. I mean, they're not stupid. It was only 2,000 years ago. They knew what happened when people die. They'd seen people die. They knew where Beethoven and Mozart are. They're decomposing, you know. (laughs) I've waited for years to tell that stupid joke. They were not dumb. They understood death. 
And they weren't anticipating a resurrection any more than you or I would. They'd never seen anything like it. And it says that Jesus came and stood among them. And here's where the story departs from Uncle Bob. The story that I just gave of Uncle Bob, by the way, Uncle Bob is still dead. But that story is really very similar to what John 11 describes in Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Uncle Bob came back from the grave. His body was reconstituted. It was the same body. The resurrection of Jesus was nothing like that. Because the detail of this story, in case you missed it, these guys were behind locked doors and Jesus showed up. He passed through the wall or he just appeared. Meaning, and they recognized him, they knew who he was, but there's something different about this body that passes through walls. And the resurrected Lord opened up his mouth and this is the first thing he said to them and this is the first thing the resurrected Lord says to the world. He said, peace be with you. If you know Hebrew, that's similar to the word shalom, peace be with you. That isn't peace and quiet, but it's a peace. It's the Greek word, irene. If your name is Irene, your name means peace. But it's not that kind of just peace and quiet and absence of quarreling in the household. It's a peace that means, it's a comprehensive peace. It means wholeness. It means everything's complete together. It means all things are put right. The resurrected creator of the universe came and his first word was, peace be to you. And how could he say that? Well, here's how he could say that. He's the Prince of Peace, and he's standing in the room with him. And he showed them his hands and his side, which means something strange about this. They recognized it was him, same personality, the wounds that he incurred on the cross. He had those, but something different about his body. He passed through walls or locked doors, or he showed up behind uh, locked doors. And you just got to think about that. Those of you who are into superpowers, you know, Superman and Batman and Spider-Man and whoever is else comes down the pipe, yeah, superpowers are kind of cool. But just think about this one superpower. If this is all anybody had, they could show up behind locked doors. Think about it. If that's all you had, that would be enough to bring down every world power, every dictator, every military complex, if that's all you could do. And you know what they said when he showed up behind locked doors. They said, what? They didn't say indeed. And when they scraped themselves off the floor, he showed them his hands and his side. They recognized it's Jesus, but there's something different about him. You know, there are critics of the resurrection. There are pastors in churches today, in pulpits today, who will not say to their congregation that they believe in a historical resurrection of Jesus. They're all over the country because we're so sophisticated. And the argument, the only argument goes like this. Well, scientifically, it's impossible but I want to tell you something, historically, it is possible. Because the argument is, well, you know, scientific method is that something has to happen and it has to be repeated in order for it to be true. Anybody heard that? Well, that works fine in a laboratory for some things, but in real life it doesn't work because history is full of events that happen once, were never expected, never anticipated, never imagined, and they happen once and they changed everything from there on out. Does anybody remember 9-11? September 11, 2001, no one went to work expecting somebody to fly planes in the Twin Towers. Nobody anticipated it. Nobody imagined it. And when you watch the television that morning, everybody's with their mouth gaping open saying, what is going on here? We never imagined that could happen on American soil in our modern age. But it did happen. And it may never happen again, but it happened once, and because of that one event, everything in America has changed. Our security systems, our national security, the way we do international diplomacy, the economy. Every time you go to an airplane, you know the world's changed. History is full of unprecedented events that change things. Only here's the thing about the resurrection of Jesus. People say, well, it couldn't have happened because we just can't have any categories for someone dying and rising from the dead. Well, here's the deal. A guy who passes through walls is a different kind of body. Wouldn't you agree? I would agree. And we don't have words to express or describe what happened. But we do know this. People who say it couldn't have happened because we can't imagine anything ever happening like that in history. Well, here's the deal. 
You say resurrection violates all the current laws that we know of space, time, matter, and energy, and that's really true. But what happened was God has broken into this world and he has opened up a window to a whole different world of a whole different set of physical laws of space, matter, time, and energy. In other words, the resurrection of Jesus is a window to a future world where there will be a new heaven and a new earth and a new creation and all who put their faith in Jesus, the Bible says consistently and clearly that Jesus who resurrected first and the Jews expected a resurrection in the last day, they didn't expect it to happen in a calendar day right in front of their eyes. Jesus broke all the rules, but the Bible's clear. You believe in Jesus. What we witnessed that day, 2,000 years ago, and the, when the end comes, Jesus is going to take us with him, and there's going to be a general resurrection of the dead with a new heaven, a new earth, a new creation, new space, matter, time, and energy. And the reason we don't have categories to describe or understand the resurrection of Jesus is because those are the times and rules uh, and quadrants of a whole a creation to come. Did I just make any sense? Just say yes and make me feel better. He showed them his hands and his side. You ask me how I know he lives. God made a dramatic change in my life. 35 years ago, he delivered me from a d destructive addict addiction to alcohol right on the spot. He gave me a hope where I had no hope. He gave me a future where I had no future. I owe everything to him. You ask me how I know he lives. He came, he stood among them, passed through walls, locked doors. He said, peace be with you. He put all things right. And then he showed him his hands and his side. And then he had to say it again, because I'm sure that they were still face down on the floor. He said, peace be with you. And then look what he did. He deputized them. You know what deputized means? It means I have my badge and I take it off and I put it on you. The work God has called me to do, I now give it to you. He said, as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. In other words, I'm not saving you so that your life will go better, so that you'll have a ticket to heaven when you die. I'm saving you so that I can send you. And what am I sending you to do? I'm sending you to bear witness that God has broken into the world and that we know now how the story's going to end and Jesus lives. By your words, by your life, by your posture, by the trajectory of your heart, by your speech, by your investments, by your relationships, by how you walk and how you talk, you are now to be sent into a broken world and say there's a good thing coming. His name is Jesus. He doesn't save you just to save you. He saves you to send you. And that's the amazing thing, that he would use the likes of me or the likes of you, no matter what your resume reads or how smart you think you are or how dumb you think you are. Jesus can use you to put in a good word for him and bring hope to a lost world. He deputized them, and you ask me how I know he lives. I know Jesus is risen. Through all of the trials, triumphs, and challenges I have faced on my life journey, I have had an indescribable peace and an unquenchable joy fill my heart and soul. That peace and joy have never ceased. Through the sorrow and sadness of losing my dad, two brothers, my beloved son Austin to cancer, and now the recent passing of my mother, my heart can still sing, it is well with my soul. Through a 17-year marriage to an abusive spouse that involved many scary situations, I felt a certain security and wing of protection from my Heavenly Father who watched over me and my three children. God also protected me from an intruder and serial rapist when I was 18 years old. God has protected me in three potentially fatal car accidents, as well as protected all of my children at different times in car accidents. God has not only shown me his power of protection, but also his blessings. He has provided for all of my needs. He has provided for me to become a registered nurse and placed me in a position that allows me to daily share my faith and life experiences with others. When people ask me why I still love God, even though he didn't answer my prayer to heal my son Austin, I tell them that God most assuredly did answer my prayer. He didn't do it in the way I wanted him to. He did it in the way a loving, all-knowing, heavenly Father needed to. I don't pretend to understand, nor can I fathom the mind or intentions of the Lord. I just know His ways are not my ways, and I cannot try to put Him in a box that I design. 
His plan and purposes are to give us a hope and a future. He had a bigger plan for Austin than I could ever imagine, and I know he is rejoicing with his Savior. Death is a tragedy, but for a Christian, death has no sting because we will be victoriously joined with our Creator in a mansion prepared for us, doing the will of our Father. This place is just our temporary home, a training ground for what's to come. How will we spend our time here? Will we bring glory and honor to God by all that we say and do? Will our life reflect His love by our testimony of trust in Him? I could never stop loving God because my life didn't turn out exactly the way I hoped or planned. I can only love God even more because He took all of the ashes and breathed new life to my dry bones. He is helping me heal, forgive and be forgiven for my shortcomings, reach out to others, and press on. Until I see the Lord face to face in heaven, the risen Lord will live through me. I emailed Joy yesterday. I said, Joy, how do you know Jesus is risen? And that's what she wrote. <laughs> I said, give me a couple sentences. And I know Joy is a nurse. She prays with people. She tells people about Jesus. And having been through what she's been through, people listen. And today she is down south at her mother's funeral. So I appreciate Joy sharing that. He came and he stood among them. He said, peace be with you. He showed them his hands and his feet. He had to say it again, peace be with you. And then he deputized them and then he breathed on them. And he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now in those days, it's interesting how God speaks in the context of a culture, of a context of a worldview. In those days, the, it was considered the breath of a person was their soul. And when you're at a deathbed and that person breathed their last breath, that last breath went out, the soul left the body. What was Jesus saying when he breathed on them? He was saying to them, the breath of the living risen Christ, I'm sharing with you. I'm bequeathing to you. Now, they didn't receive the Holy Spirit till seven weeks later. We'll celebrate the day of Pentecost on June 4th. The Holy Spirit didn't really come till then, but what was he saying? He was giving them a sign to anticipate. He's saying, I'm breathing my life into you. I'm deputizing you to be a witness, but you can't do it alone. I'm going to live in you. I'm going to give you my life. I'm going to give you my heart. I'm going to give you my thoughts. I'm going to give you my perspective. I'm going to give you my power. I'm going to give you my presence. I'm going to give you my love. And he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Whoever you forgive on earth will be forgiven in heaven. Whoever you withhold forgiveness here will not be forgiven. I'm giving you that kind of authority, he said. He came and stood among them. He said, peace be with you. Showed him his hands and his feet. Said it again. Deputized them. Breathed on them. You ask me how I know he lives. My life changed on Monday, the 23rd of January, when I got the call that my husband Rod had collapsed at the gym with a heart attack. I rushed to the hospital, not aware of the seriousness of it. But for the next 12 days, I waited for him to wake up. Seeing how strong he was coming through the initial surgery, I was sure he would be okay. I was sure he would come back home. He was only 55 and in great shape. But he wasn't okay, and he never woke up. As the days wore on and the damage to his brain became evident, I had to make the difficult decision to have the medical staff remove the life support. I made that decision at noon, February 4th. At first, our family gathered around his bedside and watched him breathe on his own. Over the next few hours, it gradually slowed, and then, late into the evening, it stopped. Rod was now home with the Lord, but I was left here. As this new reality began to sink in, I was faced with a barrage of questions and doubts. How do I live my life without Rod? How do I raise our two girls by myself? Rod and I had been together 26 years. I felt so scared and alone. Before all this happened, we had stopped going to church. We always kept saying we needed to go back, but life got busy, and there was always a reason we couldn't make it. Why did I ever get too busy for God? With Rod's passing, 
I made the decision to go back to church and to put my trust and my new uncertain future fully in God. He is the one who has control over my life, and I know he will see that we get through this together. He has been doing just that and more. He is so faithful. My hope is in the resurrection. Because of this hope, I wonder what Rod is doing in heaven every day, and I look forward to seeing him again. Wow. I asked Anna if she would say why she believes in the risen Lord, and I know that wasn't easy for her to write. And she's still getting her equilibrium after what a shock to her family. And our prayers are continuing to be with Anna and Megan and Brooke and the rest of the family. But I know that when Anna tells other people about the hope in Christ, that's a hope that's been forged in real life. Because you know Jesus will have the last say. When you give your life to Jesus, that doesn't mean everything all of a sudden is going to be hunky-dory and nothing bad's going to happen and you're going to win the lottery and everybody's going to love you. But you put your faith in your future in the one who will have the last say, and he will have the last say. And I praise God for that. He showed up behind locked doors, and he said, peace be with you. And he showed them his hands and his feet, and he said it again. And then he gave them a job, and then he breathed on them and promised them the Holy Spirit. He saves you so that he can send you. Where you live, where you work, where you play, and he will send you so that he can reach the next person. And he's wanting to reach the next person so that he can reach the world. And he wants to reach the world because he wants to come back. And he's going to come back to bring all of us with him. That's the Easter story. Do you know him this morning? Is your hope in something that solid? Because you gotta put your hope in something and you might as well put your hope in something strong, someone strong. He's risen. And how?